so chapter three, the safe food handler. So this chapter, um, the study questions that we're going to go over are how can food handlers avoid behaviors that can contaminate food? How should staff wash and care for their hands? What is the correct way to dress for work and handle work clothes? Where can staff eat, drink, smoke, and chew gum or tobacco to minimize contamination? And what is the best way to prevent staff who may be carrying pathogens from working with or around food or from working in the operation? So food handlers um, can contaminate food by having a foodborne illness, um, wounds or boils that contain a pathogen, um, sneezing or coughing, as it's shown in the book, um, in the pictures to the left. Um, when they have a contact with a person who is ill and when they use the restroom and do not wash their hands. So we talked a lot about this last week um, in chapters one and two, um, oral to fecal contamination. Um, and then when they have symptoms such as diarrhea, vomiting, or jaundice, a yelling of the eyes or skin. And we also talked about that um, last week um, with norovirus and hepatitis A um, and different um, illnesses like that. So some actions that can contaminate food are scratching the scalp, running fingers through the hair, wiping or touching the nose, rubbing an ear, touching a pimple or an infected wound or boil, wearing and touching a dirty uniform, coughing or sneezing into the hand or spitting into, in the operation. So some ways as a, a food handler manager that you can um, navigate these issues are by creating personal hygiene policies for your staff to follow, training food handlers on those policies and re retraining them regularly, modeling the correct behavior at all times, supervising food safety practices at all times, and revising personal hygiene policies when laws or science changes. So that's like one thing um, that would have had to go on when COVID happened. So like people started wearing masks in the restaurants. So that would be an example of revising policy um, when, you know, laws change or health regulations change. Um, mm -hmm. So moving on now to hand washing and hand care. Um, so this is the main way to prevent spreading pathogens. So hands have to be washed in a sink designated for hand washing. They cannot be washed in a sink that is designated for food preparation. Um, so all hand washing sinks must be, wa must be marked. Um, that they are designated for hand washing only and there should be no food preparation in that sink. Um, and then, you know, you wanna notify your employees um, and train them to know to not wash their hands in the food preparation sinks either. For so, the um, apply your knowledge, do you have the answers for it? Was, do you have the answers for apply your knowledge? Yeah, so we're gonna, for now, we're gonna skip the apply your knowledges okay. just for sake of time. But um, for this one, we want to write an X next to number two and number three. Um, so number two, she's touching a dirty uniform. And then mm -hmm. number three, he's touching his ear. Okay. But I and had checked for it. He's well. going to go back and touch, you know, the food after okay. touching his ear. Mm -hmm. So the correct way to wash hands um, is wet hands and arms. So you want to wet not just your hands but sometimes like food might touch your wrists or your lower arms so you want to make sure you're washing you're washing your arms and wrists as well um applying soap scrubbing hands and arms vigorously for uh for 10 to 15 seconds usually you'll see people just like splash a little water uh just you know shake them up a little bit and rinse them out you want to make sure you're getting under your fingernails um the back of your hands in between your fingers um, your wrists and your palms. Um, rinse hands and arms thoroughly with running warm water and drying hands and arms um, with a single use paper towel or a hand dryer. Single use paper towel is the best way. Um, hand dryers sometimes grow a lot of bacteria inside of them. So a single use paper towel is the best way um, to dry your hands because it won't, you know, reintroduce any pathogens onto your hands that you just cleaned off. So when to wash hands is also important. Um, this can take away from um, cross-contamination 
and then like spreading pathogens after touching something. So you want to wash your hands after using the restroom, touching body or clothing, coughing, sneezing, blowing nose, or using a handkerchief or tissue, eating, drinking, smoking, or chewing gum or tobacco, handling soiled items, handling raw meat, seafood, or poultry, and taking out garbage, handling service animals or aquatic animals, handling chemicals that might affect food safety, changing tasks, so before beginning a new task, leaving and returning to the kitchen or prep area, handling money, using electronic devices, and touching anything else that may contaminate hands, such as dirty equipment, work surfaces, or cloths. So if you see someone that's not using the, follow, the proper procedures um, and they are touching things in the kitchen, you want to dispose of the contaminated food that they may have touched um, after, you know, doing one of these things that we just mentioned that you're supposed to wash your hands after. Um, cleaning the equipment, equipment that they touched. So this could be um, utensils, pots, pots and pans, um, counter spaces, maybe wipe those down, things like that. Um, and you want to retrain and coach food handlers who aren't following the proper procedures so you won't have to take so much time into cleaning after um, they touch those things over and over again or mm -hmm. running the risk of pathogens getting into the food, making people sick in your restaurant. Um, and then that'll mitigate a lot of risk and um, time that you'll have to take to follow back after, up after that. So hand, hand antiseptics, um, also known as hand sanitizers, can be used, but we don't really want to use them um, as often, and we don't want to use them in place of hand washing. They can be used after, but not in place, and we don't want to touch anything until the antiseptic is dry on the hands. So some hand care guidelines um, are fingernail length. So we want to make sure our nails are short um, and clean. So there's not really a chance to get any dirt or, um, like any soiled sub substances underneath them. Um, cause that carries a lot of bacteria, um, wearing false fingernails. Um, they can keep a lot of bacteria or dirt underneath them as well as break off into the food. Um, but you can wear false fingernails if you're wearing gloves over top mm -hmm. of them or nail polish as well. Um, nail polish hides dirt under the fingernails. So we wanna avoid wearing nail polish. And if we, and it does chip off sometimes and that can get into the food as well. So yes. we wanna um, make sure if we do have nail polish on that we wear gloves on our hands. Mm -hmm. um, so infected wounds or boils to contain those boils while we're preparing food. Um, we want to make sure that there's a barrier between the boil or the wound and the food. So if you have something on your hand, you want to bandage it and then put a glove on. So there's a watertight barrier um, between the wound and the food that you're preparing. Um, if something is, you know, on a different part of your body, you just want to make sure it's bandaged and it's covered um, when you're around the food. Mm -hmm. So we're going to skip over that applier knowledge. Um, and just for reference, all of the answers to the applier knowledge are in the back of each chapter. If you want to um, read over it and then go over it later. No, oh, okay. I, didn't, I looked. I didn't see applier Yeah, knowledge. it's on for this chapter. It's on page 3.24 and 3.25. Okay, let's see. So when we're handling um, food, we wanna use single use gloves. So single use gloves um, are gonna protect the food from anything that can be on your hands, dirt, pathogens, things like that. Um, and you're gonna use them when handling ready to eat food. So, the gloves you want to buy are approved gloves. Um, they're approved for food service. You don't want to just go buy a random glove um, mm -hmm. because it's not 
it's not meant for that reason. Um, some gloves disintegrate with oils sometimes, um, mm-hmm. or they let like different things permeate through them. We want to make sure it's like a solid glove meant for food handling. Um, the glove should be disposable. You should never wash gloves. Um, once the gloves are used and they're taken off, they need to be thrown in the trash. Um, providing multiple sizes to your employees is also important. Um, if there's a glove that's too small, it might rip while someone's um, preparing food. If it's too big, it might just come off. Mm-hmm. Um, and then providing latex alternatives. Some people are allergic to latex. So that could be the people you're preparing the food for or the people who are preparing the food. So we want to oh, make sure wow. that, you know, we have options um, when it comes to the type of gloves we want to use. So how to use gloves. Wash your hands before putting on gloves and starting a new task. So you don't need to change um, your gloves each time you start a new task. You're performing the same task, but um, you want to make sure your hands aren't contaminated. So if they are contaminated, you'll need to wash your hands and then put on new gloves. Um, Mm -hmm. Selecting the correct glove size, like I just mentioned, some gloves that are too big won't stay on, and then those that are too small will tear a rip. Holding gloves by the edge while putting them on. So the purpose of the glove is to protect the food from your hands. So we don't want to touch the surface of the glove that's going to be touching food. So we want to use the edge of the glove to pull it on rather than touching this area or this area. Mm -hmm. Um, And then check check the gloves for rips or tears once you put them on. So some things we don't want to do are blow in the gloves, um, roll them to make them easier to put on, or wash and reuse them, like I just mentioned. Mm -hmm. So when to change gloves, um, you want to change them if they become dirty or torn before beginning a different task. After an interruption, like taking a phone call, um, that kind of defeats the purpose of using a glove if you, you know, touch your phone with the glove. Um, after handling raw meat, seafood, or poultry, and before handling ready, ready to eat food. So raw meat, seafood, or poultry carry a lot of contaminants. So that's a lot of um, cross-contamination if you, don't t- if you don't throw the gloves away, touch something else. And then after four hours of continuous use, so you want to make sure we have fresh gloves and they're not susceptible to rips or tears. Um, so that's the reason behind changing them so often. Well, not so often. That's not really that often, but, um, you know, four hours that's is a, a decent amount of time. So we want to make sure that, you know, the gloves aren't going to disintegrate while we're doing tests. So you don't want to use um, your bare hands on ready to eat food. That's the purpose of using gloves. Um, but you can use um, your bare hands on food that is being prepared to cook. So um, you can use bare hands on food that will be added as an ingredient to a dish that doesn't contain raw meat, seafood, or poultry, but will be cooked. So the example here is adding cheese to pizza dough. So that's a ready to eat food, but that food is going to be cooked again. So it's going to kill anything that you might have, you know, passed with your bare hands. Um, or the food will be added as an ingredient, as an ingredient to a dish containing raw meat, seafood, or poultry, and the dish will be cooked to the required minimum internal temperature of the raw items. So adding seasoning to um, poultry or anything, it's going to be cooked. So you can use um, bare hands for that. So moving on to eating, drinking, smoking, and chewing gum or tobacco. So drops of saliva can get, um, can be spread through the kitchen um, when doing any of these things. So you wanna make sure uh, you're, using the proper steps when doing these things. So you don't wanna um, eat, drink, smoke, or chew gum or any of those things when prepping or serving food, working in prep areas, or working in areas used to clean utensils and equipment, in equipment such as like a dish pit or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, if you are to 
um, drink in a kitchen, you want to make sure it has a closed covered container and you're handling it in the right way. So some work attire guidelines are hair restraints. So you want to wear a clean hat or other restraint when in a food prep area. So food doesn't, or hair doesn't fall into the food. Also, um, men that have large beards or long beards might need to wear a net so their beard hair doesn't fall into the food. Um, so you don't want to wear any hair accessories that could fall out and get into the food um, or false eyelashes because they might fall off and get into the food as well. Um, wearing clean clothing. So dirty uniforms or aprons can be a point of cross-contamination. Um, if you're getting, say, juices from raw chicken and then touching your apron and then touching, you know, another item that can lead to cross-contamination. So you want to make sure, you know, your clothes are clean, your aprons are clean, things like that. Um, aprons, you know, that's another thing um, we mentioned last week not wearing apron in a restroom because mm -hmm. a lot of pathogens can get on the apron that way and jewelry. So the main, um, the only jewelry you really want to wear in the kitchen is maybe like a necklace or like a wedding band. But other than that, you shouldn't be wearing any jewelry mm -hmm. in the kitchen. And then moving on to reporting illnesses. So staff should always report illnesses before coming into the job, into the workplace, um, and then letting you know immediately if they get sick while working, um, they should let you know so you can take the proper precautions. Um, so you want to exclude employees if they're vomiting, have diarrhea, um, jaundice. I know we talked about that last week. Um, with hepatitis, it's a yelling of the eyes and skin, um, sore throat with fever, or with fever, an infected wound or boil that is open or draining, unless it's properly covered with like a bandage or something. Mm. Um, and, and staff must also tell you when they've been diagnosed with norovirus, hepatitis, Shigella, Shigatoxin producing E. coli, or Salmonella typhi or non typhoidal Salmonella. Um, and then they may must also tell you if they live with someone who has any of those diseases as well. So some things you can watch for concerning staff illness is vomiting, excessive trips to the bathroom, yelling of the skin, eyes, and fingernails, cold sweats or chills, persistent nasal discharge and sneezing. Yeah. So now we're going to um, look at the chapter review case study. So Robert is a food handler, handler at a deli. It is 7.47 a.m. and he has just woken up. He is scheduled to be at work and ready to go by 8 a.m. When he gets out of bed, his stomach feels queasy. He blames that on the beer he had the night before. Fortunately, Robert lives only five minutes from work. Despite this, he does not have enough time to take a shower. He grabs the same uniform he wore the day before when prepping kitchen chicken. He also puts on his watch and several rings. When Robert gets to work, he realizes that he has left his hat at home. Robert is greeted by an angry manager. The manager puts Robert to work right away, loading the rotisserie chicken, rotisserie with raw chicken. Robert then moves on to serving a customer who orders a freshly made salad. Robert is known for his salads and makes the salad to the customer's approval. Robert made several errors. Identify as many as you can on the lines below. Well, he didn't take a shower. He put on a dirty apron. Mm -hmm. And um, he also was sick. He didn't know one way or the other. Was it the mm -hmm. beer or was it um, something else? But regardless, his manager put him straight to work, even without having the hat. He left his hat. What happened to the hairnet? And he was dealing with raw, raw food. So that definitely can bring up um, a contamination to the food. Mm -hmm. And the salad, the salad was um, um, 
I believe could be contaminated as well. Right. So the other thing he also didn't do was remove his jewelry. Right, right. So that was one of the things that he should have um, done in that situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he put him right to work. Mm -hmm. So we are going to um, skip over the study questions and move on to chapter four. So if you want to do the study questions later on, like kind of like as a quiz for yourself, you can do mm -hmm. that with um, the answers on 3.22. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so chapter four, the flow of food and introduction. So the study questions for this chapter are how can you prevent cross-examination? How can you prevent time temperature abuse? And what is the correct way to use and maintain th thermometers? So the flow of food is how, you know, it starts from when you purchase the food to when you serve the food to a customer. So steps are purchasing, receiving, storing, preparation, cooking, holding, cooling, reheating, and service. Yeah, so. Hmm. So we did talk about, um, cross-contamination and time temperature temperature control um, previously, but just to go over that again, just for a refresher, um, cross-contamination is just spreading um, pathogens from either foods or unwashed hands to other food um, that may not contain those um, pathogens. So you want to make sure you know you're washing hands, you're washing utensils, you're wiping um, prep areas with sanitizer, things like that. And then time temperature control is when you are not um, cooking food to the right temperature or leaving food out at a temperature that is not supposed to be. So um, leaving cold foods out at room temperature or leaving hot foods out at room temperature, that's a way for bacteria to grow. Um, and then things such as not cooking chicken to the proper internal temperature can also make people sick. So mm -hmm. some guidelines for preventing cross-contamination between foods are using separate equipment for raw and ready to eat food, mm -hmm. um, cleaning and sanitizing before and after tasks, prepping raw and ready to eat food at different times, and then buying prepared foods. So some ways to avoid time temperature abuse are to monitor um, your food. So knowing which food items should be checked, um, how often and by who um, is a way using tools. So making sure you have the right thermometers to measure the temperature of the food to make sure it's still at a viable temperature before you have to dispose of the product. Um, recording. So recording the temperatures of the food regularly. Um, so this could also go with recording the temperatures of your refrigeration or your freezer to make sure that it's at the right temperature. Um, so nothing's broken and making sure that all the food stays where it's supposed to be. Um, time and temperature control. So having procedures to limit um, the time food spends in the temperature danger zone. So you don't want to remove too much food from the fridge if you're not going to use it, right? So right. if it's out for so long, that's a hazard. So we want to make sure we're just only taking some out at a time um, and then putting it back immediately and not letting it sit at a room temperature for too long. Um, and then corrective actions. So making sure food handlers know what to do when time and temperature standards are not met. So the example here is holding soup at a, on a steam table and letting the temperature fall below 135 degrees. So after two hours, um, you want to reheat it to the right temperature or throw it out. After that, it's just not seen as a viable food anymore. 
because it has been um, time temperature abused. Hmm. So let's move to the um, types of probes on page 4.8. So a big part in um, time temperature, avoiding time temperature abuse is being able to um, measure the temperature of different foods, different um, surfaces. Um, like I mentioned before, your fridge, your freezer, um, hot holding areas are also um, things you can, you can take the temperature of. And then different foods um, later we'll go over um, deliveries. So you should always record the temperature of those foods as well. So you have immersion probes. So that's used to te check temperature of liquids like soup sauces or frying oils. Um, surface probes um, used to check the temperature of flat cooking equipment like griddles. Um, penetration probes that's used to check the internal temperature of foods. And then air probes use to check the temperatures inside coolers and ovens. So once you use these temperatures, you want to, or sorry, thermometers, you want to make sure you're cleaning and san sanitizing them. So they have to be washed, rinsed, and sanitized. Um, and that'll also avoid cross-contamination between different foods. So we can move on to the chapter case study. So okay. at 6 a.m. Hmm. I'm sorry. Where are we at? The chapter case study. Okay. At 6 a.m., Annie started her work day at the Little Bistro. After a quick meeting with the chef, her first task was to make the broccoli quiches for the lunch special. By 6.15 a.m., she had collected all the ingredients. She sent salt, eggs, cream, butter, and cheese on the prep table. On her last trip to the cooler, she got the broccoli. It took over an hour to wash and chop it. Finally, Annie was able to make the quiche filling. Leaving the leftover eggs and cream on the table, she got out the pre-made quiche crust from the freezer and poured the filling. By the time she got the quiches in the oven, it was 10.45 a.m. 25 minutes later, Annie checked the quiches. They were supposed to bake for around 30 minutes. However, she did not want to overcook them. The chef said their internal, internal temperature needs to be 155 degrees Fahrenheit. Annie used an infrared thermometer to check the temperature of one quiche in two places. The readings were in the correct range. She took the quiches out of the oven and set them on the table to cool. While the quiches cooled, Annie went to work making fruit salad. She washed her hands and put gloves on. As she headed back to the prep table with the melon, strawberries, and grapes, she noticed the eggs and cream she left out. She quickly put them back in the cooler. Then she wiped down the table and started prepping the melon. What's an Annie do wrong? I think first of all, starting to the end, she put the eggs and the cream back in the fridge and they had been out since 6 a.m. that morning. Mm -hmm. um, I think that was way too long um, as far as her temperature as well for the um, quiches. She didn't want to overcook them, but I don't see if they said, they said she Annie. She used the temperature in one quiche in two places. I don't know if she should have did all of them or just one. But so that one, um, she used the wrong kind of thermometer. So she oh, should have okay. used the probe thermometer. And the probe thermometer is for is used to measure the internal temperature of foods. Okay. Um. I'm not sure about what else she had made done because as far as her cheese and eggs, I knew that, but I'm not sure. It took her a long time to prepare it, though, before she could even get it in the oven. That right. was kind of disturbing to me. Right. So she also didn't clean and sanitize the table um, after she prepared the quiches. And before she started oh, yeah. cutting the melon to make the fruit salad. Um, and then she didn't wash her hands before making the quiche either after mm -hmm. her meeting. 
Mm, switching tasks. Right. She should have thrown away the leftovers instead of putting them in the fridge. Mm-hmm. Okay. Definitely got to put them back in the fridge. You know, um, well, I won't. I know when I was younger, my dad used to always leave the butter out and these things. And as I got older, I would always tell him, no, don't leave that butter out. And I do also understand that products have changed over the years too, the quality of how they make things. And he would always go, oh, it's going to be okay, okay. And I do believe back in the day, it may have been okay. But um, also we lived in Michigan. It was always cold as well. Room temperature was always cold because we could put our stuff outside in the window, never use a refrigerator, right. water, pops, whatever. So, but now I had done it once before, left it out, came back in and actually smelled that it was not good. And it hadn't been, it may have been like from when I got ready to go to work and then came back right after work to bake, it wasn't working for me. Mm-hmm. I just was not comfortable, not even knowing a whole lot of this, but I used my smell test, you know, like, right. mm. so I learned a couple of things on YouTube on how, when you do, or haven't had the room temperature option, you know, I learned some tricks and hacks where I just start looking, putting, you know, your eggs in some warm water or just being able to make sure that they're not sitting out for a long period of time. Mm-hmm. And um, even cutting your butter in down in slices opposed to letting it stay whole while you're allowing it to come to room temperature. So right, it allows it, allow to, it or allows it to warm up faster. Correct, yeah. Or even use the microwave and use the product right after you microwave it to right. um, batter. So yeah, I learned some of those things, but I am very skeptical about the products these days we use. Yeah, um, our products are very processed here so like in the UK they have our eggs here are refrigerated in the store Mm -hmm. theirs are shelf stable so they sit on the shelf Mm. and not in a refrigerator I think it's also the same with their milk Um, all right they don't refrigerate their milk either it sits Mm. on the shelf so you just have to kind of be aware of you know where the products have different standards for food here than they might have there um and that also comes with like um pasteurization things like that um Mm. and just the way that the foods are treated before they come to us okay and again it goes back to our chapter one about where our products are coming from Mm -hmm. you know making sure how it's delivered how is it taken care of prior to getting to you because i wouldn't have never thought about the delivery truck being totally locked, you know, and it was right. delivering like I never thought about. It. But this is valuable. Thank you. Yeah. So that might have been the case back then, but now we probably want to put everything in the fridge. Mm-hmm. So. Definitely. Yeah. So, so chapter well. five is the flow of food, purchasing, receiving, and storage. So the study questions we're going to go over are what is an approved reputable supplier what are the criteria to accept or reject food during receiving how should food be labeled and dated and how should food and non-food items be stored to prevent time temperature abuse and contamination mm-hmm. so before you accept any deliveries you want to make sure the um food you purchase is safe um so you want to use an approved reputable supplier and we talked about that in chapter two. Um, and then you want to see the reports um, from the suppliers, from the USDA, the FDA, or um, a third-party inspector. And then there are different practices that they use um, to make sure that the products are safe. So the different practices are good manufacturing practices or good agricultural practices. So um, the inspection report should review receiving and storage, processing, shipping, cleaning and sanitizing, personal hygiene, staff training, recall programs, and HACCP program or other food safety system um, for the supplier. So when you're going to receive food, um, you want to make sure that the inspection process is smooth and safe. So you want to inspect the food 
when you receive it from the supplier. So you want to train specific staff to receive the food. So in the book, you can see um, they're inspecting the produce to make sure that there's nothing wrong with it. Um, providing them with tools like thermometers and scales. Um, and then we'll talk about a little bit more about thermometers later in the chapter. That'll be one of the um, points that we'll go over. And then make sure enough trained staff are available to um, receive and inspect food items properly. So you want to deliver them as soon as, or you want to inspect them as soon as they are delivered. Okay. So you want to start the inspection with the delivery truck. So checking for signs of contamination, um, inspecting the overall condition of the vehicle, looking for signs of pests. And if there are, it seems like there are any problems, you want to reject the delivery. So mm -hmm. then you want to do a visual inspection of food items. And you also want to make sure that they are received at the correct temperature. So that's where the thermometers come in. Um, you want to be um, checking and recording the temperature of the food from the trucks. Um, some trucks are refrigerated, some are freezer trucks, and then some are just regular that transport like produce and things. So mm -hmm. the freezer and refrigerated trucks, you definitely want to make sure um, that no food has thawed or it's gone to an unsafe temperature. And then there are ways that you can tell that it has, and we'll go over that as well. So key drop deliveries, this is another way um, producers deliver food to your business. So you want to make sure it is a reputable um, producer. And a key drop delivery is when you receive food after hours and the delivery service brings it into your business. Okay. So you want to make sure it's an approved source. Um, it was placed in a correct storage location to retain the required temperature. Um, it was protected from contamination in storage. It has not been contaminated and is presented well. So if you want to reject an item, you want to tell the delivery person exactly what's wrong with the item. So if it's not to the right temperature, if it looks like it's been tampered with, if the packaging is damaged, things like that, you want to make sure you notify them why you're rejecting that item specifically. Um, getting a sign adjustment or credit slip before giving the item back to the person. Mm -hmm. um, and then logging the incident, incident on the invoice or on the receiving document. Um, just so you know, you make sure that you have record of why you, threw, okay. why you sent it back. Okay. So you also want to be um, cognizant of any recalls. So I'm sure you know there's always recalls on like romaine lettuce, things like that. So if there are recalls, you want to make sure that you're aware of that um, and that you don't risk that you don't accept any food that has been recalled. So you want to make sure that you're um, usually a recall will have when they put a recall out, it'll have like identification numbers for the food. So you want to make sure that the identification numbers don't match up if there's a recall. Um, and then just kind of overthinking what you want to accept um, if there is a recall on the item. Mm -hmm. So when notified of a recall, you want to match the information from the recall notice to the item, including the manufacturing ID, the manufacturer's ID, um, the time the item was manufactured, and the items used by date. You want to remove the item from inventory and place it in a secure and appropriate location um, it has to be stored separately from where the other food is stored. Um, also, utensils or equipment, um, linen, single-use items, gloves, um, employee uniforms, things like that. Mm -hmm. Label the items in a way that it will prevent it from being placed back in inventory. So do not use and do not discard um, are two things that you can put on there. And then refer to the vendor's notifications or recall notice what to what to, for what to do with the item. So sometimes they'll just say, you know, just throw it out or sometimes they'll want you to return it. Um, so you want to make sure you do either one of those. So when receiving food, 
you want to use thermometers to check the food temperature um, when it's delivered to you. So for meat, poultry, and fish, um, you want to insert the stem of the thermometer into the thickest part of the food. Mm -hmm. So um, vacuum-packed and sous vide foods, so that's reduced ox oxygen packaging. Um, you want to insert the thermometer stem in between the two packages. and make sure not to puncture it as well. And then for other packaged foods, um, they can come in containers or anything like that. Um, you wanna open the packaging and insert the thermometer into the container um, to get an accurate reading of the food. You don't ever wanna um, take the temperature from the outside of the container, it's not accurate. Mm -hmm. So packaging, um, food items and non-food items should be packaged correctly. Um, you wanna make sure they're delivered in their original packaging with the manufacturer's label. You don't want them to like take it out and put it in any other packaging. Um, so it should be sealed. It should have, you know, the manufacturer's logo on it, things like that. So if you have any items that are damaged, you wanna reject them. So if they have, Dents um, in the seams or in the body of a can, missing labels, swelling or bulging ends. So that usually um, lets you know that a product has gone bad um, or rust on the can. So that's basically showing you that it wasn't stored properly. So you don't want to accept any cases or packages that can that appear to have been tampered with either. Um, you want to reject items that have been touched by liquid. So with anything with leaks, um, dampness, or water stains, you can visibly see it. Um, if something is wet on paper packaging and it dries, it'll look wrinkled. So that's another way you'll be able to tell. Um, rejecting items with signs of pests or pest damage. So if you see any holes, droppings, things like that, you want to reject the items. And then dates. Um, all your food should be correctly labeled. So you don't want to accept anything that, ha that has a missing use by date or a missing sell by date. Mm -hmm. So the sell by date is how long the store should display the product. And then a use by date is how long or is the time in which you should consume it at home or in your business um, before you throw it out. Mm -hmm. So you also wanna make sure that you um, check the food quality. So poor food quality can be a sign that the food was time temperature abused. So if it's moldy or has an abnormal color, um, or if it's moist when it should be dry, the example they give here is like salami. It should be dry, but if it's moist, then you know there's probably something, you know, it was it was warm for a period of time. Um, and don't, I'm sorry. Oh, I was gonna say in chicken, I learned that one about the stickiness of a chicken. Mm -hmm. When you get chicken, it could possibly be, um, contaminated or no good just no good to use right so that was actually the next one um texture so reject meat fish or poultry that is slimy sticky or dry mm -hmm. um also reject it has soft flesh that leaves an imprint when you touch it so mm -hmm. it shouldn't really like have any give mm -hmm. or it should have like a bounce but if <laughs> it just you press into it and it leaves your fingerprint you don't want that um reject food with an abnormal or unpleasant odor, like the butter, for example. You mm -hmm. wouldn't want to use that because you can immediately tell um, mm -hmm. that it's no good to use. And then you also want to just reject any item that doesn't meet your um, company standards for quality. So yes. if you're paying for an item, you want the item that you know has the same quality that you want to use in your products because you want to give your customers the same quality every time. Mm -hmm. 
So we're going to do this one, apply your knowledge. Um, so number one is dirty packaging. So this is apply or reject. Writing an A next to the food items you should accept and writing R next to the food items you should reject. So dirty packaging, you want to reject. Um, fresh fish with an internal temperature of 50 degrees Fahrenheit, you want to reject. It should be let it should be at 41 or less. Um, torn packaging, you want to reject for eggs, um, an air temperature of 45 degrees Fahrenheit, you want to accept. Um, repackaged cans of food, you want to reject that since it didn't come in the initial packaging from the manufacturer. Mm. Six is a clean intact box, you want to accept that. Um, seven is milk at 45 degrees Fahrenheit, that's okay to accept. And then cooked rice at 140 degrees Fahrenheit, you want to accept that. So moving on to labeling. So you want to label all items that are not in their original containers for use. Um, food labels should include the common name of the food or a statement that clearly and accurately identifies it. Um, so if you have salt and sugar, you want to label it salt and sugar because you're going to get them mixed up. They're very similar looking. Um, so if it's not in a container that it originally came in or a container that easily identifies that it is that um, item or ingredient without you know specifically saying that, then you want to label it. Um, and then it's not necessary to label an item if it won't be mistaken for another item. So labeling food that's packaged on site for retail sale. So if you are selling your food via retail, um, the label must include the common name of the food or a statement that clearly identifies it, the quantity of the food in that packaging. So like sometimes we'll say, um, most of the time it's in ounces, the food. Mm -hmm. um, a list of ingredients and sub-ingredients in descending order by weight. This is necessary if the item contains two or more ingredients. So if you're doing a cake, you're going to use flour the most. So it should be flour first, and then your next ingredient, and then the following um, until the least amount that you use, which I'm not sure. What would that Salt. be? Salt? <laughs> yeah, Salt. that's what I thought. Um, Flavor. A list of artificial, yeah. Right. A list of artificial colors and flavors in the food, chemical preservatives, name and place of business of the manufacturer, packer, or distributor, and source of each major food allergen contained in the food. Should that be a separate um, label, the allergy label, opposed to just being on the label itself? Because I do have optional nuts on there so not most of the time it is a separate label it usually says may contain and then it'll say peanuts eggs uh milk uh what's another big one fish like things like that um it will say may contain um separately mm -hmm. and then you also want to make sure you um, mark your items with the dates that they're good by. So ready to eat food can be stored for only seven days if it's held at 41 degrees Fahrenheit or lower. Okay. I get that question often. I'm not usually saying about seven days as long as it's in room temperature. Then that question goes, well, what is room temperature? And I'm like 70 or less. And then I read this I think somewhere earlier this week and I'm thinking oh wow I've been saying it but I just knew only because my dad again he had the bakery he was you right. know I know how to do my kitchen but he had the bakery and I guess I picked up on so much more than I thought as a kid mm -hmm. yeah kind of like clicks now that you're you know learning yeah. the information in a book yeah mm -hmm. So the example here is October 1st, um, preparing potato salad, and then October 7th would be the discard date. So 
So when storing the food, um, you want to rotate your foods or your ingredients. So you want to um, use a first in, first out method. So this method is if you get new, like a new shipment of ingredients, you want to put those in the back and use what you had already first. Um, so this prevents you from having to throw things out, um, letting your foods expire, things like that, um, or, you know, using an expired product and it might make somebody sick um, and that presents hazards to your business. So you want to identify the foods items used by or expiration date. Um, store items with the earliest used by or expiration dates in the front of items with later dates. Once items are shelved, using those items stored in front first and throwing out food that is past its manufacturer's used by or expiration date. So when storing food in um, a refrigerator, you do want to use a storage order. So the storage order is from top to bottom is ready to eat food. So these are things like um, fruits, vegetables, um, pre already prepared foods, um, ready to eat foods are going to be first. Um, seafood will be next. Um, so that's fish, um, shellfish, crab, lobster, uh, anything like that. Um, that will be second. Then you want to do whole cuts of beef and pork. Um, ground meat and ground fish will be after that. And then you want to put whole and ground poultry on the bottom. Mm and this is how it's stacked from top to bottom if you were using these items in your refrigerator should the refrigerator be yes. labeled so that the employees know where if they're not pretty familiar with them um i think that could be something helpful that you could do if they're not aware or if they're not trained um to just do that automatically um i think that that could definitely be a helpful tool to use is labeling and then we will go over the chapter review case study. So a shipment was delivered to Francesca's Italian restaurant on a warm summer day. Alice, who was in charge of receiving, began inspecting the shipment. First, she inspected the bags of frozen shrimp. Alice noticed the ice crystals inside the bags and took that as a good sign that the shrimp were still frozen. Next, she used a thermometer to test the temperature of the vacuum pack back packages of ground beef, which was 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Then Alice used the same thermometer to measure the temperature of the fresh salmon. The salmon was on ice, although it seemed as though much of the ice had melted. The internal temperature of the salmon was 43 degrees Fahrenheit and the flesh sprung back after she touched it. She accepted the ground beef and the salmon. Once she finished receiving the food, Alice was ready to put it into storage. First, she carried the bags of shrimp to the freezer. Next, she wheeled several cases of fresh ground beef and the fresh salmon over to the walk-in cooler. She noticed that the readout on the outside of the cooler indicated 39 degrees Fahrenheit. Alice pushed, Alice pushed through the cold curtains and bumped into a sock pot of soup as she moved inside. She moved the soup over and made a space for the ground beef. She was able to put the salmon on the on the set on the shelf above the soup. What receiving and storage mistakes did Alice make? Well, first of all, her thermometer, she used the same one for the beef for the salmon. Mm -hmm. And I don't believe she was supposed to do that. Um, as far as the shelf location for the, I believe for the, um, she put it on there with the soup, the ground beef. I think she, let's say she made a space for the ground beef and it, she was able to put the salmon on the shelf above the soup. But what happened to the ground beef, the soup? She made one, I don't, they on the same shelf. Mm -hmm. No, that's a no, no. Right. She put them on the same shelf. Um, 
I'm not sure about the temperatures. I wasn't quite sure if the temperatures for any of the things she was using was correct. Were they? So the salmon should have been rejected because it was at um, 43 degrees and it should have been at 41. Okay. And then the shrimp should have been rejected because it had ice crystals. So that's usually an indication that the food was thawed and then it froze again. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so that's unsafe. Um, hmm. And yeah, she put the raw salmon above the ready to eat food. And she should have checked the temperatures of the food stored inside um, the cooler. Mm -hmm. Now you should be having um, records about the temperatures on each time you check it. If you have someone monitoring the refrigerator, it should be recorded or somewhere nearby the refrigerator to know that these were the temperatures. Um, I think you should be recording the temperature of the refrigerator. Um, okay. when you do check it. All right. Hmm. All right, and that is our study session. Well, we did good. I will go good. over this one again. I did see our last week's YouTube being posted. Yes, it was. <laughs> and I looked and was like, that's me. I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> I looked at it like, oh, I know her. <laughs> yes. So um, if you want to, you know, relook back at this, um, you can. It should be up this week um, sometime. Let me stop the recording.